Good morning everyone. My name is Ian Sharp and I'd like to, this morning to make a sort of small offering of some of my favourite moments from A Child's Christmas in Wales by Dylan Thomas. One Christmas was so much like another in those years around the sea town corner now and out of all sound except the distant speaking of the voices I sometimes hear a moment before sleep that I can never remember whether it snowed for six days and six nights when I was twelve or whether it snowed for twelve days and twelve nights when I was six. All the Christmases rolled down towards the two-tongued sea like a cold and headlong moon bundling down the sky that was our street and they stop at the rim of the ice edge fish freezing waves and I plunge my hands in the snow and bring out whatever I can find. In goes my hand into that wool white bell tongue ball of holidays resting at the rim of the carol singing sea and out come Mrs. Prothro and the fireman. It was on the afternoon of the Christmas Eve and I was in Mrs. Prothero's garden waiting for cats. With her son Jim, it was snowing. It was always snowing at Christmas. December, in my memory, is white as Lapland, though there were no reindeers, but there were cats. Patient, cold and callous, our hands wrapped in socks, we waited to snowball the cats. Sleek and long as jaguars, and horrible whiskered, spitting and snarling, they would slink and sidle over the white back garden walls, and the lynx-eyed hunters, Jim and I, fur-capped and moccasin trappers from Hudson Bay, off Mumbles Road, would hurl our deadly snowballs at the green of their eyes. The wise cats never appeared. We were so still. Eskimo-footed Arctic marksmen in the muffling silence of the eternal snows, eternal ever since Wednesday that we never heard Mrs. Prothero's first cry from her igloo at the bottom of the garden, or if we heard it at all, it was to us like the far-off challenge of our enemy and prey, the neighbour's polar cat. But soon the voice grew louder. Fire! cried Mrs. Prothero, and she beat the dinner gong. And we ran down the garden with the snowballs in our arms towards the house. And smoke, indeed, was pouring out of the dining room, and the gong was bombulating, and Mrs. Prothero was announcing ruin like a town crier in Pompeii. This was better than all the cats in Wales, standing on the wall in a row. We bounded into the house, laden with snowballs, and stopped at the open door of the smoke-filled room. Something was burning all right. Perhaps it was Mr. Prothero, who always slept there after midday dinner with a newspaper over his face. But he was standing in the middle of the room saying, A fine Christmas, and smacking at the smoke with a slipper. Call the fire brigade, cried Mrs. Prothero as she beat the gong. There won't be there, said Mr. Prothero. It's Christmas. There was no fire to be seen, only clouds of smoke. And Mr. Prothero standing in the middle of them, waving his slipper as though he was conducting. Do something, he said. And we threw all our snowballs into the smoke. I think we miss Mr. Prothero. And ran out of the house to the telephone box. Let's call the police as well, Jim said. And the ambulance. And Ernie Jenkins. He likes fires. Bring out the tall tales now that we told by the fire as the gaslight bubbled like a diver. Ghosts wooed like owls in the long nights when I dared not look over my shoulder. Animals lurked in the cubby hole under the stairs and the gas meter ticked. And I remember that we went singing carols once when there wasn't the shaving of a moon to light the flying streets. At the end of a long road was a drive that led to a large house and we stumbled up the darkness of the drive that night, each one of us afraid each one holding a stone in his hand, in case. And all of us too brave to say a word. The wind through the trees made noises as of old and unpleasant and maybe web-footed men wheezing in caves. We reached the black bulk of the house. What shall we give them? Hark the herald. No, Jack said. Good King Wenceslas, lass. 
I'll count three. One, two, three. And we began to sing. Our voices high and seemingly distant in the snow-felted darkness round the house that was occupied by nobody we knew. We stood close together near the dark door. Good King Wenceslas last looked out on the feast of Stephen. And then a small, dry voice, like the voice of someone who has not spoken for a long time, joined our singing. A small, dry, eggshell voice from the other side of the door. A small, dry voice through the keyhole. And when we stop running, we're outside our house. The front room was lovely. Balloons floated under the hot water bottle, gulping gas. Everything was good again and shone over the town. Perhaps it was a ghost, Jim said. Perhaps it was Trolls, Dan said, who was always reading. Let's go in and see if there's any jelly left, Jack said. And we did that. Always on Christmas night, there was music. An uncle played the fiddle, a cousin sang Cherry Ripe, and another uncle sang Drake Stream. It was very warm in the little house. Auntie Hannah, who had got onto the parsnip wine, sang a song about bleeding hearts and death, and then another in which she said her heart was like a bird's nest. And then everybody laughed again. And then I went to bed, looking through my bedroom window, out into the moonlight and the unending smoke-coloured snow. I could see the lights in the windows of all the other houses on our hill and hear the music rising from them up the long, steady, falling night. I turned the gas down. I got into bed. I said some words to the close and holy darkness. And then I slept.